Welcome to this event, uh, an international trade webinar that is brought to you by the UK Export Finance and the Association for Renewable Energy and Clean Technologies, of which I am a director. It's a very timely event, of course, directly post COP26 and the UK taking a continual lead in the way that the uh, this COP is, is, is transforming uh, the energy systems across the world. And we will, we will continue over the next year and indeed beyond that to take a, a very high profile lead role. So therefore, it's important that the government and our association get together and, and make that happen and take advantage and be a of the government's objective of growing our total export sales to one trillion pounds by 2030. And I'm sure renewable energy will be part of that. Um, the association has over 500 members focused obviously on renewables and clean technology. And we have established this, this international group to help our members and indeed the UK renewables market to grow trade internationally, which is vital to the success of our company, of our country as well. Um, so we, the session today is broken into three lots. First of all, we have presentations from UK Export Finance and then DIT, two very senior managers. We will be sharing the experience of several successful companies in, the, in this space. And then finally, we'll have a networking one-to-one -one meeting session, which is a very excellent feature of this platform with UKEF and DIT, and indeed uh, ourselves from the Renewable Energy Association. As, as, as I'll explain that a bit, a bit later in the, um, in, in the session. We encourage questions to be put on the Q&A tab, which you can see in the top right of your, of your screen, I hope and expect. And the questions will be placed, first of all, to the initial speakers, and then at the end of the, um, at the, end of the individual company presentations. Ideally, form the questions as you go through, you collect them on the, on the Q&A, we will go through them and select the, the highest numbers of you know, the same question, and because obviously we're quite limited here in terms of time. So without further ado, let me transfer you now to the first section, which is uh, going to be two speakers, Julian Lin of UK Export Finance and, and Spencer Clifford of DIT. Please welcome uh, Julian Lin, Regional Head of Middle East and Pacific for UK EF, and he will be introducing financial support available for UK export and their global opportunities in this renewable environment. So Julian, over to you. My name is Julian Lin. I'm a Regional Head for UK Export Finance, and I've got to give you share a few slides um, um, to show how UK EF can help um, the uh, the development of the renewable energy industry um a bit of background from me and uh, you know it's really great to be on these kind of events i was in a past life uh, underwriting our first of what turned out to be three offshore wind projects in taiwan and that was a transformative um activity for ukf it really did immerse us in the whole renewable energy industry and the uh, the sort of imperative behind it. Um, so anyway, just to briefly talk about UKF and and as I say, great to be on this um, on this presentation today. So the next slide, please. UKEF sits within the UK Treasury, so we are part of the UK government, and our role is to help all exporters achieve their export contracts, their export potential. Um, we work with the Department of International Trade, which has two big pillars to it. One is the pillar of our global network of embassies, the UK franchise globally, a very powerful, arguably one of the most powerful international representations, which is there for you to exploit. And secondly, the sector specializations that we see in the DIT, uh, which Spencer represents, and that is a fantastic group of people that are, their specialization is to understand the supply chain that the UK has for each of the new emerging exciting areas, uh, whether it's offshore wind, whether it's solar power, whether it's hydrogen, 
carbon capture, battery storage. So those are the, the two main pillars. And uh, our product range has been built up, I would have to say, over 100 years. So I'd like to think it's one of the first ECAs, export credit agencies, to be created after the First World War. Uh, we've established a good understanding of the needs of UK exporters and of their buyers and borrowers to incentivize those buyers and borrowers to get to buy from the UK. And indeed, we've been an award-winning ECA. Next slide, please. Um, the scale of our support is typically around eight to 10 billion pounds a year. Um, it's bigger this year, as you can imagine, post COVID and, and post Brexit, we're intervening a lot more. And in our new strategy to help clean growth, which is very important businesses like yours. Um, it's the key message here, I think, is to say that if we hadn't been involved, it's quite possible a lot of that uh, export activity would not have happened. So it, it is an interventionist approach, which is an enabling <clears throat> financing for projects, for exporters, uh, for contracts that probably otherwise might not have happened. Next slide, please. Um, we have a lot of capacity, um, uh, underwriting capacity here, uh, which is granted to us by the Treasury, directly by the Treasury. And I think that shows the confidence and faith that the UK government have in what we do. We're not a, uh, a loss making entity. We buy, buy, in fact, we are a, uh, a just about wash our face. We don't go out there to make losses for the UK taxpayer. We take a very careful look at everything we support. Uh, <clears throat> and that capacity there is, is, as I say, I think designed to make sure we can shift the dial globally on UK export activity. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, if press, oops, go back a bit. I think if you keep pressing, next slide, okay. Um, value proposition here is really a, an ability to look at all in any sectors. We offer our financing cover, uh, which is finance available to buyers and borrowers in over 200 countries. We do that in 60 local currencies, which is very important when you're looking at long term off take obligations to match the currency of the country you're trying to export to. We offer credit periods of up to 18 years <clears throat> and we have a network of global banking relationships, which we can also help to bring uh, to to assist in the financing of a project. Um, finally, just to mention that the main golden rule we have is that anything we look at, obviously we're representing UK interests here, must have a 20% UK content. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, if we go build out, press the button, you'll see a, a emerging picture of the network, keep pressing, of our network here of relationships between exporters, overseas buyers, the global DIT network, both as I talked about in sector terms and in the global representation of the UK government. Um, and UKEF, for the at key points, sits in the middle, sits in the heart of that activity. Um, so I think it's important to say that once you've made contact with UKEF um, and you've established a dialogue with us, that you're talking to the right people and we can bring help bring the rest of the UK government. And by contrast, if you're talking to an embassy or a sector specialist here in the DIT, they too can bring us into the conversation. Next slide, please. We offer a global network of IEFE representatives. I think there are about 20, so there will be even new faces to add to this, with particular emphasis on markets we see with huge potential growth, for example, in the Middle East, the Far East, um, Eastern Europe, interestingly enough, Africa being a fantastic region for us. Uh, we have six dedicated IFEs in Africa alone and Latin America, where we're seeing new uh, opportunities. Next slide, please. And also to help you, we have a domestic network of export finance managers, and their job is to sit with you as an exporter and help you identify the needs for financing that you have with your bank. Next slide, please. 
So our products, I think, broadly fall into uh, three categories. The, what we call the long-term financing, which is typically offered to an overseas buyer. And we do that by providing a guarantee to a bank uh, in order for that bank to fund a project. And this is a very well tried and tested uh, product. For example, we used it with our three offshore wind projects in Taiwan, and uh, that enables one or more exporters and or international contractors who purchase from the UK, uh, where a UK content is through a tier two or three or four supplier, access the financing, which is typically long term, 18 years in the case of renewable energy uh, facilities. And our guarantee to that bank is for all risks. And it is a guarantee structure. So that's what we call the buyer credit financing. And that is something that you can offer a buyer um, if they're looking for financing for their project. Then we have what we call the exporter guarantees, which are domestic financing that go to you as an exporter that are there to help you uh, finance a contract. So you've won it, you've got need to provide bonding support, working capital, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and it's it's tailored for your contract to enable you to A, fulfill that contract, but B, manage the cash flows associated with it uh, and indeed pass on, hopefully, more attractive credit terms to your buyer. Then finally, we've got trade credit insurance. I would emphasize this point that in certain markets or certain areas, this sits alongside the, the commercial insurance market. Generally speaking, British exporters are underinsured um, compared to our European counterparts. And I have dealt with so many businesses that have failed to insure their trade, their contracts and have, as a result, lost a great deal of money. So I would just put that in the back of your mind to always think about trade credit insurance for your contracts. Next slide. Uh, so we talked about the, the support we can provide. It is based on the one or more UK companies within a supply chain. And we offer up to, uh, uh, we supported up to 140 companies. But uh, indirectly, you can imagine for larger projects, this can extend to a very large network of UK uh, supply chain exporters. And so that means that even though your particular export contract doesn't necessarily involve an export, if the people you're supplying to are in turn exporting, then you would qualify for our support. Next slide, please. The short term focus I talked about that the working capital scheme designed to provide a banking facility to help you bridge and manage your cash flows between funds that you're spending uh, to fulfill the contract and when you receive income, bonds where you have to post bonds and the export credit insurance policy. The first two schemes are designed really to provide a guarantee to your bank for up to 80% of the need that you have. So the bank has to have some skin in the game, but that allows you to extend these schemes. And the export credit insurance policy is designed where the market, the private, the commercial market, for example, does not have appetite or the appetite is prohibitively expensive uh, to, to, to insure a contract uh, against any kind of failure except for the failure by the exporter themselves. Next slide, please. Um, this is a newish product and it's a more general export facility that we're rolling out to smaller businesses to allow them to invest in new green technology and in new capacity. Um, and this is more bespoke. It has been used a lot in the COVID crisis where a lot of businesses were struggling. Uh, but also to recognize that we're all of us in this critical, pivotal, transitional phase for moving from a hydrocarbon world into a sustainable, clean growth world. And UKF is very, very keen to play its role in helping businesses make the necessary investment for that transition to take place. And that the Jeff is one of those uh, products. Next slide, please. And this is the second product. Uh, for example, we've used this export development guarantee financing for people like Jaguar Land Rover and Ford to invest in their new uh, electric vehicle require, uh, installations and, and factories. Um, and it's, it's going to be something that will be, uh, I think, probably more readily used now 
as businesses begin, the, 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 the sort of momentum builds behind businesses transiting and investing in new green technology. Next slide, please. We have a supply chain discount. This is recognizing that the UK, generally speaking, sits, does not have mainly contractors. We have tier two, three, four sub subcontractors. And so this helps provide an offering to a global supply chain or lead contractors from other countries in order to purchase from the UK. Um, and it allows for a, dis a discounting effect to be provided through uh, a, a longer, more complex supply chain. Again, a bit specialized, but something that can be discussed with your bank. Next slide, please. Um, we talked about it, we're all here on this call and we all understand the global imperative. UKF is in fact seen as a key instrument for the UK government to help enable clean growth globally. And uh, there is this 10 point plan the Prime Minister has announced, and uh, we are here to help all and any businesses that are in what we call the clean growth um, space. And we have special products I've mentioned earlier, but also special funding, special relationships that we can help you with as you pursue these projects globally. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at this, this, this transition imperative. And, uh, you know, certainly when we looked at the three offshore wind projects in Taiwan, they all came along together quite quickly. They had very aggressive timeframes. And we as UKF had to come along quickly alongside other export credit agencies of other countries, sometimes up to eight of them, in order to deliver a turnkey financing, which has allowed these, in this case, large um, 10 megawatt turbines to be installed uh, off the coast of Taiwan and achieve, help Taiwan achieve a 25% grid installation for their offshore wind projects. But in doing so, that has also facilitated the partnership and development of, of collaboration between UK companies, global companies and Taiwanese companies as the world develop its own global supply chain for offshore wind. And we hope this will be a uh, uh, replicated for other other needs in solar and hydrogen eventually uh, as well. Next slide, please. So we look at clean growth. I think all of us here understand the imperative and almost crisis situation that we face ourselves in. So this is a deep penetrative um, uh, section analysis of all all of the of the needs that uh, occur. Obviously, renewable energy leads with that. But in the UK expertise area, it does include a lot of other other areas from pollution control, energy efficiency, climate change adaptation and um, uh, recycling and all aspects of sustainable growth. So this is aligned to the green bond principles. And so please don't think about just an orderly headline renewable energy projects. As I say, there's a lot of variety. Uh, to the kind of changes we're trying to make to uh, the global sustainable growth um, areas. Next slide, please. This is uh, close to my heart. I personally was involved in underwriting this project uh, only three years ago. Uh, hard to believe, but a lot has happened in three years. So this was our first sort of move into renewable energy. Faced a lot of challenges at UKF, but I like to think that we rose to those challenges and took on a lot of risks that we didn't uh, have experience of before in understanding the technology, the regulatory risk, the supply chain issues, and how these projects are brought together. But it does show how the UK can take its own uh, expertise and start to help another country begin to uh, make this energy transition. Um, and so the, 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 the learning from this, I think, was that we were able to provide competitive financing pull in the UK content, the UK, UK supply chain into these projects. And now we have established really strong relationships with most, if not all of the main global offshore wind developers like Allstead, like Macquarie, like Copenhagen Invest Infrastructure Partners. And so building on those relationships, we hope we can help further develop UK interests and support for global offshore wind. Uh, next slide, please. This is an example of a British company. In fact, Solar Century, those of you who may know, it was the largest 
uh, solar developer in the UK, got badly caught out by the change in UK subsidiaries for solar. And we had to enable these, this company to transition into exporting. And so this is an example of the domestic facilities I talked about earlier, going into a business to scale up for a new opportunity there. Next slide, please. Uh, so there's an example of all of the uh, the stuff we've done recently. As I say, really great to be on the call. I very much hope we have a chance to further up discuss one-to-one -one or in little uh, groups, but very keen to explore with you and your in association all in any opportunities or needs or concerns or issues uh, that you may have and to see how UKF or the wider UK government can help you achieve what we all know needs to happen. Thank you very much again uh, for listening to me today. Thank you. Uh, Duncan, I think perhaps over to you. Yes, Julian, I can't thank you enough. That was an absolutely outstanding presentation, absolutely rich with opportunity and, and, and direction as to how we can work together. And as the association, I, we sincerely look forward to doing that with you over the next two or three thank years, you. which are the Please. critical period. Yeah. So thank you again. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is to uh, introduce you to uh, the next speaker, who, who is Spencer Clifford. Uh, Spencer is the head of renewables at DIT, um, and he has some important words to tell you about another government department and their direction. So please, Spencer, over to you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh... Hello, uh, my name is Spencer Clifford. As, uh, as previously said, I'm the Head of Renewable Energy at the Department for International Trade. And um, if there is uh, one thing I could say, it's um, if you, we work quite closely with UCAF and it is an excellent offer. And if you are interested in exporting, absolutely do look out for their services. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? So today we'll be talking about the uh, Department for International Trade. Uh, and how we can support you in exporting or encourage investment into renewable energy and clean growth sectors, uh, clean growth and DIT's role, green investment, exporting UK capability, and the resources and how to uh, how to approach our department. Next slide, please. So the Department for International Trade is a relatively new department. Uh, after exiting the EU, we were established in 2016. I joined uh, the department in the, in the energy team about 2017. Um, we support, our role is supporting UK businesses to grow internationally in a sustainable way. So that isn't necessarily, so when we say UK companies, we don't mean companies that are just uh, headquartered in the UK. If you have a presence in the UK, we will absolutely support you to export overseas. Uh, our number two, ensure the UK remains a leading destination for international investment and is the number one location for international investment in the stock uh, investment stock in Europe. Open markets, building trade frameworks with new and existing partners, which is free and fair. We do this through free trade agreements, um, working with governments to reduce barriers in terms of uh, market access. And we use trade and investment to underpin government's agenda for global Britain and its ambition for prosperity, stability and, and security worldwide. Next slide, please. So DIT has a critical role in delivering the clean growth agenda and maximising the value from that. Clean growth is the core of DIT's central function, trade policy, export promotion and attracting foreign direct investment. You'll have seen examples of this recently at um, the GIS, which brought over just under 200 of the world's top CEOs to encourage um, in and around 10 billion investment um, and sort of work that we did around uh, COP26. So we use our independent trade policy to reduce trade barriers to green trade. We uh, promote the UK's exports overseas, delivering great, uh, green, green solutions overseas and attracting foreign investment to build UK's green industrial base and level up UK jobs. Uh, and you should, you should start to see that in the offshore wind sector. We started to see some announcements coming through about parts that previously weren't uh, of, uh, of turbines that previously weren't manufactured here. They, they will be manufactured in the future and we're incredibly excited about that. Next slide, please. So 
my team, uh, our role is uh, sits within the HQ of the department. We work with posts internationally where we have energy experts all around the globe looking at opportunities in those markets and trying to support companies who are interested in those markets. And they provide intelligence to us. So, so, so what my team does is we, um, we, we help companies access some of those opportunities and, and internationally using that network. Um, we work with other, other government departments primarily Bayes and DEFRA, um, but they might they might be others where, where appropriate um, to ensure that investment and trade is sort of a core part of their of their policy as it develops. You'll have seen the hydrogen strategy recently launched and the heat and build strategy um, the, the sort of talk about supply chain and uh, the, 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 the importance of developing that is not an accident. We work very closely with them. Um, market development. So working with um, working with overseas governments to unlock opportunities for UK companies that might be through development aid, it might be through um, change, you know sort of um, working with them to develop new policies for new sectors such as hydrogen, and supply chain development. We can't export what we don't have. We need to ensure that uh, there's a robust supply chain that is um, really securing the value for the UK in those sectors. Next slide, please. So between 1990 and 2019, the UK reduced, reduced greenhouse emissions by 43% compared to just 5% for the G7 as a whole. At the same time, the UK economy grew by almost 80%. I always reference this because I think it's really important. It is a myth that you have to, uh, you, you cannot grow your economy and reduce your emissions. We've proved that and we are proving that now. And that is a huge reduction in emissions. Um, so the UK was the first G7 country to set in law target uh, a target of reaching emissions uh, by net zero emissions by 2050. The UK's pioneering carbon budget approach has become the standard global mechanism for reducing greenhouse gases, allowing for UN, the UN Paris Agreement. Um, recently, and I'll come on to this later, you'll see in the 10 point plan um, that, that anticipates about 36 billion private sector investment and supports 250,000 new jobs by 2030. And you'll also see the, the infrastructure bank, 12 billion of equity and debt capital and issued the 10 billion guarantees to private sector, local authority infrastructure projects across the UK. Next slide, please. So the 10 point plan is sort of the centerpiece of where, where we're focusing our attention. We do not just focus on these sectors, it's important to say. Uh, energy from waste isn't on there for, uh, for obviously. Um, but but that is integral to our approach. But it is it is it is uh, very useful areas, and these are these are core priorities for us. So, looking at this, advanced offshore wind, 160 million for port, uh, manufacturing infrastructure, uh, low carbon hydrogen, 240 million net zero hydrogen fund. The business model is also out for consultation at the moment, um, and will support the production of uh, of low carbon hydrogen. And I'd encourage you to all engage with that if you haven't already and you were interested in hydrogen. Uh, advanced nuclear fuels, 425 million for advanced nuclear fund, including um, inclu this includes funding for uh, fusion, which is, um, you know, it, it's always it's always seen as being far away, but it, it would be such an, a such a massive boost for um, the approach to net zero if we ever get there. Um, and I think it's interesting because a lot of other governments, there, there, there is a debate about whether or not nuclear should be part of the picture. It absolutely needs to be part of it. It needs to provide energy for the baseline. And I, I think it's really important that it is there. Uh, green, plant, uh, green, green public transport, Jet Zero and, and green ships funding for a collaborative R&D in, in the private sector. Green billion, green buildings, one billion to create market incentives to increase energy efficiency in new builds. And within that, there, there is a 600,000 uh, annual target for heat pumps. That is huge. We're, I think we're running at about between 30 and 60,000 annually. So there's a lot of growth there, but there absolutely will be the, the demand for it in the future. And um, that is a huge priority for us to encourage investment into that sector. Carbon capture and storage, 1 billion infrastructure uh, fund to, to establish CCUS and in industry. 
to, to establish a CCUS industry, you're starting to see investments flow into those sectors and, and, and we're really encouraged by that. Natural environment and of course, green finance and innovation, the 1 billion net zero innovation portfolio. That is 42 billion across all sectors. Next slide, please. So how do we support uh, investors? Um, through our bank knowledge specialists ex expertise and extensive knowledge, DIT can help identify and leverage potential opportunities, both for trade and investment. DIT uh, is an interesting department in that it, it does bring in uh, specialists from industry to support our work. So, so we are not just a team of specialists. We have people with decades of experience within the team and you know sort of assessing where that where where it's best to prioritize our resource so the services we provide overseas companies include accessing uh accessing market opportunities within the uk accessing and introductions to the right people within the uk and government departments setting up within the uk we provide a range of support for applying for visas entry to the uk to set up procedures to the uk tax system and site selection bespoke market research. We do this We do this for exports and investment. Ongoing government support, continued support after your business is established in the UK and entrepreneurial assistance through our network of mentors to help make commercial sex of early stage companies. Next slide, please. So we, we believe we're well placed to take advantage of these opportunities and establishing new energy systems. So again, we focus on market development, policy with regulatory expertise, environmental consultancy services. In clean power, we support offshore wind, waste of value, established technologies such as solar, tidal, and nuclear. We also uh, look at grid integration and optimization, energy storage and electricity networks. And we also support the energy transition, oil and gas decommissioning, carbon capture use and storage, hydrogen, low carbon heat. So that's within our team. Um, it's worth mentioning that that is not, if, if, if there is a technology that's not in there, that doesn't mean we don't support it. We support all technologies, but these are the areas that we're primarily focusing at the moment. Next slide, please. We act as a single point of contact for potential and existing exporters from the UK, providing impartial advice and support. So there's free and confidential assistance that is tailored to business needs and the confidential uh, that should be underlined and, uh, un underlined and bolded. Uh, we take that incredibly seriously within the team. Extensive market intelligence, expert business support services as well. Our services are supported by teams and markets around the world. Next slide, please. So our service portfolio, accessing overseas market opportunities, and I'll get more into that later, advice in doing a business in markets, connecting business to overseas buyers, access and introductions to the right people, helping select the best market location, partnerships, providing local market research, ongoing support, in-depth market knowledge and export finance through UCAF. And I will get more into how you can access those services uh, later in the slide. Next slide, please. So these are the resources you can ac access either through gov.uk or um, or the great website. Export market guides that can help you find opportunities uh, and prepare to do business in new markets. So these are the, these are individual market uh, sort of briefings that will give you the information that you need and contacts to get into those markets. We provide advice on whether or not. Uh, whether you're a new, occasional, or frequent exporter, we can offer advice from creating an export plan and finding an export market uh, to finance the risk management. Events, trade fairs, missions, and webinars. Obviously, events have been hit by recent events, but they're starting to 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 escalate again. And you know, I, 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 we're we're starting to see much more in present events, and we're 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 really happy to support companies in going to those. Um, country export guides, international trade advisors. We have networks of advisors all over the country. So you don't have to just be near London. You can be in the Northwest, Northeast, Cornwall, anywhere. Scotland um, is supported by SDI and uh, Wales has other devolved uh, agency support as does Northern Ireland. Um, UK export finance, you, you just had a presentation on that, but please do access gov.uk or um, 
all great if you want to access those services. And onto the next slide, I also wanted to give a specific call out to the Investment Atlas. This is a website that we've just produced on great.gov.uk. Uh, it highlights within clean growth sectors all the massive investment opportunities around the UK and sort of gives a, a briefing on those different technologies and why they're interesting opportunities. It's really good. You can, uh, there are search functions on it so you can find specific opportunities. And if you feel that um, yeah, you have an investment project that should be on there, please do feel free to reach out. Next slide, please. And lastly, uh, we've just launched the Export Academy at COP. Um, DIT is supported to UK exporters tapping into the sector, expected to be worth about 1.8 trillion by 2030. The UK is ideally placed to maximize these opportunities due to, a genuine, to its genuine climate, climate leadership. For further information, you can register for upcoming events, access our current resources and contact your local DIT officers. So please check out the UK Export Academy. I went on there last night and I pulled off the, the event on clean technologies and mining webinar uh, and the link to signing up on that is, is on the last slide. So please, if you are a first time exporter, this is to make it easy for you. Uh, please do check that out. Uh, next slide, please. And there are my details. If you would like to reach out, I can also be reached out on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Spencer. That is a super, again, another outstanding presentation that is really so helpful because I don't think I realized that you had quite such a UK coverage. And if you're reaching out to industrial specialists, you know, feel the association is right with you. The, that our, our force and capability will be very supportive, I do assure you. So um, if we could move on to a question and answer session here. So maybe if Lynn would like to join us as well. Lynn, uh, sorry, J Julian, you're back, uh, you're back on again. So we're, we're, we're live for a, a, a relatively short question and answer session. Um, I do have, I do have two or three here that, that have come in. Um, it's, first of all, uh, Julian, for you, um, what is the future commitment of UKEF to supporting, uh, it says renewables, but we, mean, we know that means renewables and low carbon and so on. Um, is, it, is it becoming more of a specialized area? Do you see more resources going into it? Is it something that you see more of in supporting overseas trade for the UK? And, and yeah, <clears throat> no, no, great question, Duncan. I think, you know, where to begin with that? The, the first thing is the scene set. Uh, the UK government strategy, you know, post just post COP26, but also generally is to align the whole of the UK government to this sort of single purpose of promoting clean growth and uh, sustainable development. Um, and UKEF's right at the heart of that, as we talked about with the financing side. We have identified a clean growth pipeline of projects globally that approaches about £10 billion. Wow. And so we are working with governments right across the world. I mean, whether it's Africa, Asia, the Middle East, <laughs> Eastern Europe, Latin America, on their projects. And that can be ranging from the enabling framework right the way through to specific projects they want to implement. Um, we have within our UK business, which is only about 500 people to be fair, um, but the, the bulk of our underwriting team sits within what we call a renewable and energy transition team. So that is made up of dedicated specialists, just as Spencer outlined, who mirror the broad the broad categories of new technologies so we have people looking at solar wind hydrogen uh recycling waste management uh nuclear all of those sector specialists sits within an underwriting team so the whole of the ukef as an organization is aligning itself to those needs and penetrating the markets globally as we said through our global network and then finally as i mentioned i think getting these products fine-tuned to support that 
really in two main areas. One is the long-term 18-year credit horizon we offer someone who offers renewable energy. And on the other side, um, organizing the supply chain, understanding who's doing what, and those facilities that could go into an exporter. I mean, one in particular needed to uh, invest in uh, uh, offshore wind vessels, new specialist vessels that have been building all these turbines, hundreds of them around the world, but you've got to have a maintenance crew that can visit them in all weathers of whatever. And they 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 needed to design a new vessel which can go up to these things and uh, position right beside them to offload a crew to do repairs. So they, they would get a, they were looking at a facility for them, electric vehicles, transportation. Um, we've recently done a two billion project in Egypt for a light rail scheme because that involved taking cars off the road. So it is a vast shift yeah. um, that's going on um, and we're only a part of it, but we do see it as an absolutely critical mission. And I think everyone in UKEF is alive to it. Thank you, Duncan. Yeah. Julian, you are an unbelievable ambassador for the, for the well, for the, no, uh, I mean, you know, for our, for our so, asking, I think. Yeah, thank you. Well, well done. So, um, Spencer, if I may, I've got a, a question, two or three questions for you. Um, a lot of richness there again. Um, to start, uh, I mean, some of our members are, are exporters, but I mean, I we believe that twenty percent of them can, thirty percent of them can be exporters because obviously we represent every trade, uh, every type of technology pretty well across the renewable board. So we're very keen to be helpful and support them and, and drive them towards, you know, towards the work that you're doing. You mentioned, um, you know, startup workshop, and then you mentioned uh, you are a one-stop shop. Just could you articulate how that, how that works for companies that want to, and it, it, that, that maybe already are in exporting, but just want to boost it along. You are a one-stop shop. Does that mean that you liaise with Viz? Does that mean that you, you know, you uh, work closely with Mr. Sharma, and of course you work closely with Julian's department? Perhaps you could just articulate how that works. Uh, so, so, so it depends on what, uh, what, what the issue or the opportunity is that you're trying to approach us with. So, so if it's a policy uh, concern or or something that you think is a barrier to trade, we would, you know, if it, if it's a policy within the UK, we would reach out to that relevant department, highlight the issue, have a discussion with them, and if there is something actually, you know, that 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 we can change to support exports or investment, we would work with that department. To ensure um, there was a change in policy or, 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 or some sort of support available, if if that was what was required, um, in terms of accessing uh, sort of support around the country, so you have the um, Export Academy, so so they're they're going to provide sort of training sessions and sort of give you early uh, sort of uh, intelligence on how how to export. If you are uh, more um, if you are more used to exporting, if you've done it before, it's not a new process to you. Uh, we, but you're, you're experiencing barriers. Again, we, we have market uh, access, um, a market access database where we log issues that, that, that are coming from the sector. And, and so we try and overcome that with overseas governments. Um, if it's just wanting intelligence or market intelligence, um, the best place to look is the great uh, great.co.uk website or uh, gov.uk. There is a wealth of information there that you can access in terms of market um, sort of market papers. So if I was, so, so, so to put it in real terms, if I was interested in exporting uh, either particular uh, technology that I thought would be useful in say Qatar, Saudi Arabia, somewhere in the Middle East, there would be um, re a sort of market intelligence. And I would also be able to access, uh, to contact the post out there to provide, um, uh, to provide me with a more detailed analysis that may cost. Uh, we, we have to recover our services, uh, our costs of services somehow, but most of the advice is free. Um, and I would encourage everyone to reach out and, and sort of access those services if they can. Spencer, super answer. Do we, presumably you have a team of people with you, so perhaps you could nominate somebody that we could use as our conduit and, you know, because obviously it's it's difficult accessing 20 different people with 20, 20 different routes in. So maybe a single conduit would be really helpful for us, but we'll just chat about that offline. Um, we were very pleased to see hydrogen up there. Our association, as you know, is very big into hydrogen. We're very keen on that. We note your comments on nuclear, and obviously we're all coming to terms with what this final mix is going to be. 
for the energy transition, and I'm, I'm sure that, that that will certainly be part of it. But right now, I just want to thank you both for your extraordinary professionalism and well preparedness for this morning. It only bodes well for you know for groups like us and and, and the rest of the country to get exporting, and you'll have to leverage us as as well as uh, leveraging you know we us leveraging you as it were. So thank you very much again. Really helpful. Thank you, Duncan, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. Thank you. Well, very I hope much, you're, you're going to be around for the for the table sessions later on. So we look forward to that. Many thanks, Duncan. Thank you very okay. much. Great cool. to be on with Paul. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Maurizio Zaglio, and I'm the head of global partnerships at Sanamp. Many thanks to the organizers for inviting me today, and I apologize for not being there in person. In the next few minutes, I will introduce our company, technology, and products to you. I will then focus on the international side of our business with some practical advices about doing business abroad that I've collected from my colleagues in the last few days. Sanam develops and commercializes heat batteries, compact, efficient, and powerful thermal storage units based on phase change material. Our mission is to transform how we generate, store, and use it in order to make a significant global impact on tackling climate change and safeguarding our planet for future generations. Our drivers are linked to the climate change and its effects on our lives, as well as the global rise of megacities with decreasing space in homes and related difficulties to fit the incumbent technology commonly used as thermal storage, the water heaters. Our target is to maximize the self-consumption and penetration of renewable energy for space heating, cooling, and hot water, add the benefit of thermal storage to every house, and reduce fuel poverty that is still a big challenge even in our region. Why are we focusing on thermal storage rather than electrical storage? Well, the global final utilization of energy represented in this plot is a big driver for our company. As energy is largely consumed as thermal energy, we strongly believe that thermal storage can have a bigger impact on how we can clean our energy eager processes than electrical storage. Our innovation is in the development of stable, performant and long lasting phase change material uh, called Plentigrade. Plentigrade is a material that is solid below certain temperature and liquid above it. By melting and freezing, it can store and release large quantities of thermal energy. We have multiple materials in our portfolio that range from about minus 70 degrees Celsius to plus 300 degrees Celsius, with more being developed and refined as we speak by our in-house team of material scientists. By using these materials, we are active in the residential, commercial, industrial, and even automotive spaces at different scales. Today, our heat batteries with one of our proprietary plenty grade material, the P58, are the first and only PCM product awarded a Mark A by RAL Quality Association for its long lasting performance. Our products were independently assessed by the ZAE Bayer in Germany, and they found that the performance of the storage units after 10,000 cycles did not significantly degrade compared to the first cycles. Internally, we have confirmed those results for more than 40,000 cycles. Main benefits of our batteries compared to conventional water heaters are compactness, as our storage is multiple times smaller than a water tank, able to store and provide the same amount of heat, efficiency, measured as very limited heat losses over time due to the compact size and to the fact that we use very effective vacuum insulation panels, and furthermore, as we do not store heat in water, we have very little water in our technologies, leading to an intrinsic safety and high hygiene of the heat battery. We have today a range of standard products that we offer in multiple markets globally, ranging from a few kilowatt hours capacity for residential applications displayed here on the left, to larger units for commercial and industrial applications shown here on the right. I mentioned that our priority is on decarbonizing the way we heat, cool, and generate hot water in our homes. 
as using a heat pump as thermal energy source is a very efficient way of doing so. We are very active in integrating our heat batteries to heat pumps from multiple companies, either directly or in collaboration with such companies. Some of the names of heat pumps compatible with our storage today are displayed here, with some pictures taken from real projects on the right. Since the real beginning, Sanamp has always believed that our solution was not local but global, and we have engaged with international stakeholders even when we had nothing more than a proof of concept available. Our first purely commercial sale, actually after more or less three years of R&D, was to a Danish company interested in testing our heat batteries. After multiple trials in the UK and Scotland, our first major contract with an OEM that has started to sell our batteries in their markets was also international, uh, namely with Flamco, and a major manufacturer of HVAC components based in the Netherlands, but operating globally. Today, it is worth mentioning that we are active in China and proudly exporting from our factory in the UK into China for serving the local luxury market. We have recently opened a second factory in Korea with a partner and we will keep sending key components from our factory in Scotland to serve this factory. We have kicked off in October a project in New York State to demonstrate our technology in eight trials, and we are present in multiple European countries, either directly or with distribution partners. We are today about 60 people, and we could reach such a global presence by having an international mindset from day one. This is massively helping the growth of the company. This global view of our company has actually also helped a lot to find international investors, as shown in this slide, that, has not, that have not only contributed with their investment to accelerate the development of the market and the growth of the company, but that also greatly facilitated the development of our international network through them, collecting information about international markets where such investors live and operate, and to constantly maintain a global view of our solution. On a practical level, trade missions have been and are of huge help to enter a new market and to develop new relationships in existing markets. The European community, UK and Scottish governments are really, really good at organizing them and there was not a single trade mission that was not somehow useful to our growth, even when we took part to the first ones with a little more than a working prototype to show and to talk about. Please apply to them and you will gain access to partners, investors, customers, university and research groups, local government bodies, associations and organizations that all want our technologies to work in their markets. Let me say that again, if you believe that your technology is great and should not be li limited to your local market but can work everywhere in the world, then all the stakeholders that I've just mentioned and that you will meet on trade missions will want to help you be successful in their markets. So please take this opportunity to scale up rapidly. I would like to conclude with some practical advances from me and my colleagues. Some of you may be well aware of this, but I hope that they can be of help to at least some of you in your internationalization process. Assuming that you all have a VAT number, please get your EORI number that is required for international shipments. If you are at the beginning of the internationalization process, shipping companies can help you a lot with the paperwork and insurance, but as you scale up, you will need to take care of this yourself or with a partner that can do it for you to limit the cost. Get your paperwork in order before every shipment, making sure that you display all the required information as any correction might take days to apply with your good stack at customs. Carefully, carefully choose the HS code that apply to your technology, even if your product is so innovative that you cannot find a perfect fit in these codes, as they will determine import duties and in some cases they might even be forbidden or limited to import. As different carriers might use different routes or might collect different orders to a certain destination, please inquire to more than one as, according to our experience, prices and lead times to the same destination can be very different. Agree the correct inco terms with your customer to make sure that you know what you must pay for and what they must pay for. 
You cannot just use any pallet for international shipment, but they must be approved and suitable, otherwise your shipment will be uh, rejected by custom. And finally, Brexit. Local carrier and shipping companies have now adapted to new regulations and offer new products to support UK companies with their export to Europe. Please talk about them with your carriers to find out about the right procedures and costs. One last point about certification. This can quickly become a very frustrating and time-consuming process, especially if it is required to sell your products in each mar new market and especially if you are offering a new technology that was never certified before. Please consider hiring a certification manager early in your internalization process, otherwise this will quickly sap up a lot of energies and time that you should use in other activities of the company. What challenges are you going to, to face? Payment terms. Be ready to negotiate, especially if long lead times are involved, because of course your customer will insist to pay only when they receive and test the product. About your customers, always check the credit rate and, at least for big deals, due diligence them. Be careful about scammers as the fact that travelers and meeting in person are now limited. It is difficult to audit everybody and they know this. You will be asked to sign multi-languages contract, but surely your attorney will recommend you to keep English as the legally binding language. Going around a new city or country might be difficult, especially if they speak poor English in the area. A good interpreter that comes to you to meetings will be very useful for this as well. A lot of translation will be required as well, maybe even by law for certification purposes, so budget for it. Lastly, Organizing international trips is incredibly time consuming. Please get a professional involved, at least in booking flights and hotel. I hope that this was interesting. I'm sorry again for not being there live, but please contact me if you have any questions. Thanks a lot and have a great day. That was outstanding. Um, so a lot of advice there in the last slides, which we can summarize, but let me go straight to, to Alexander. Alexander runs one of the most successful organic waste of energy companies in the UK and is an ardent exporter. So, Alexander, over to you. We hope we got the gremlin sorted. I hope so. Uh, I do apologize. I tried to do it off an iPad, not a laptop, and that, that didn't work. Um, so, here we go. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. There we go. So, um, after uh, quite a lot of experience in the UK market, we Firstly, felt that the UK market was starting to slow down. And secondly, we felt that the uh, export markets were really quite exciting. And so we have uh, explored the world of AD across the, across the world, uh, particularly in food waste uh, recovery during AD. And what I'm going to go through is actually a contract we have won in Hong Kong uh, in amongst all of its various uh, uh, challenges, which is what I think we want to share with you. So the next slide, please. Um, I'm not allowed to show you the plant we're building in Hong Kong. That may be the first part of, of what we're talking about. So this is a plant we built in the UK, lovely sunny, uh, sunny green land. Um, so there are sensitivities. Uh, we're working for the government and until that plant is ready, fully commissioned, etc., it is basically under a wrapper. So uh, that is why I'm afraid I'm, I can't give you a live example of where we are. But if we go to the next slide, please. So the first part is uh, you obviously we we get a pre tender out a pre qualification and there is a layers in there which automatically will knock a lot of people out, even though some will come through. So we ended up with 65 people in the pre qualification process that was narrowed narrowed down to five. Um, we'd already started spending money by then and uh, that's it, it, it's it's a costly process. So extremely extensive documents. Um, and a very steady, long-winded tender process. Um, it was very detailed. And I think my fir first bullet point is something we learned very much from. In our pre-qualification uh, information, we were submitting information now, which we're being held to during the construction phase, even though the, that has been a three-year involvement. So uh, we, we really do have to be very careful in how you tender these things and then get held over the barrel later. Um, it's no good throwing a piece of 
foreign technology into your customer's domain and accepting them to, to work around it. The alignment of the product needs real detail to fit into the, um, the way that the customer wants it delivered. So we have pretty much a cookie cutter process in the UK. We could just keep repeating. Uh, we had to dissemble that, take all the good bits we hoped, and then recreate it for the customer in the manner they wanted it to be done. By just sitting back on the, you know, the great experience that we have, absolutely it does not cut it for your customer uh, or for our customer anyhow. And when you come up against the immovable barriers, um, you have to then start a much more long-winded long -winded process of, st of steering and educating them, even doing your own trials. But all they want to, to see and hear from you is that the A, you're com complying with their contract, and B, you prove that the system you're going to use actually works. That has taken a lot more energy than we, we expected it to. Consultants, you'll see these everywhere because uh, the government in Hong Kong really does rely very heavily on consultants. So we have an inter um, a, uh, internal checker and he, he is employed actually by ourselves as a consultancy. Uh, so that is a company called Arup. And then we have Ecom, who are the employer's representative, who do, do exactly the same job, but at the other end of the process of information submissions. Um, all of them require time to turn the information around. All of them will want to ask in-depth questions. And it gets quite alarming uh, how many people you have to then populate in your back office to keep up with their seemingly exhaustive amount, uh, inexhaustible amount of questions. If we could go change slides, please. Um, the contract, well, I mentioned earlier, not trying to squeeze de a definitive UK type operation in there. Well, culturally, it is very, very important to try and imbue yourself with your, your customer's culture. So we are obviously working now in the Far East. Uh, Hong Kong is probably a friendlier cultural place to someone from the UK than many markets, but it's still not one that we can uh, just accept, expect to be uh, treated as we would in the UK. And a lot of um, uh, sensitivity has to put into that. Don't bring your UK lawyers with you uh, because it's it, you can use a Western type lawyers normally you'll find in these areas, but it's the local legal practices which will actually give you the best advice. And some of it is advice you will never ever have heard of before in, in, this, in these processes. So that's why it's extremely important to get close to somewhere local for all the legal um, contract requirements you need. Um, I, I, the previous speaker was talking about you know, keeping everything in, uh, in English. Well, luckily, the business language in, in Hong Kong is English, but they break into Cantonese at the drop of a hat, um, which can be quite alarming if you're in a meeting. Um, and so we've had to set aside We've got five members of staff out there, of which three speak Cantonese. Um, and we then also have to be able to pay sometimes for interpretation to be done, translation, etc. So always, uh, even though uh, English is the working language of Hong Kong, it doesn't mean that everything will happen in English. Um, COVID-19 has driven a wagon and horses through our plans there. Um, uh, I haven't been to Hong Kong for nearly two years now because the quarantine requirements are ex uh, extraordinary and uh, they, keep, they keep changing and the Chinese are not allowed to, uh, about to weaken on that. So if I want to go to Hong Kong, I have to be locked in a hotel room for three weeks by myself and not even allowed out of the door, and can't open the window. And then uh, from there, I'll get on the ground and I'll do some actual work. Really has been a great challenge to keep that personal interactive relationship going. And, uh, and it's probably influenced how we're going to do things in the future, which is a shame. Next slide, please. As you can see, there are many interpretations of, of what you can build uh, abroad. And of course, all of you will know this. So you can go from the simplest design, just hand someone a piece of paper, or you can go right out to a design, build, own, operate, transfer. Um, some of these have horrendous cash flow implications from when you start. So there are contracts out there that they undercharge on the construction element, expecting you to make it up on the operational element. That gives you basically a construction cash flow issue that may last five to six years before you start um, bringing that back in line.
So be very cautious with the cash flow and be very cautious with uh, how you get to pipe payment milestones. Uh, you do not want enormously um, uh, large milestones because it takes so long to get the last bit of detail in the right place before you can claim. So you want to get them broken down pretty small. Um, they always have savage um, uh, liquidated damages in, in projects of this size, and you, you must price that in at the beginning and expect uh, to be paying some of that if you overrun. Um, very important to get the company structure right. Uh, we didn't uh, initially on this project, and it's led us to some uh, some barriers, which I'll, I'll mention later. Um, and so we, we're a bit wiser now about that. Um, the the local inexperience, because this is a brand new market for them, food waste, um, it, it has, has what happens is you get the wrong template in the tender. So we are effectively given a waste for energy to plant template to try and build an anaerobic plant, anaerobic digestion plant within. It's very difficult to turn that boat around before you submit your tender, uh, but it's it, if you can get in as early as you can and try and steer that tender, that's all the better. And once again, I bring up the uh, the, the uh, real heavy reliance on consultants at all levels, and you will have to, uh, we have to have our own design consultant out there um, to assist in what we're doing. So you know, we've got three major consultancy companies working on this project. Okay, next slide, please. My final slide. Um, once you're actually on the site and building, um, you will be uh, maybe surprised by some of the practices that are, uh, are acceptable. Some of them are things that maybe we gave up um, uh, 30 years ago. Others are ones we've never seen before and we might well adopt. But basically, you're not gonna change that unless it's obviously for a health and safety um, reason and you have to work with it. Um, Hong Kong is not an earthquake zone, and yet we're building with more rebar than I've ever, ever, ever seen um, used, et cetera, which of course gives uh, supply issues, it gives construction uh, program issues, et cetera. Uh, site workforce population. Later, uh, early on in 2022, we will have 360 uh, uh, people working on that site and it is about three acres large so it is going to be like an, an ant's army there you know, going on with that they're used to working that way i i can't see how they're going to do it but they're used to working that way and so we'll wait and hopefully see them work that way and once again you've got the consultants in there checking every single measurement every single claim you've made has to be delivered 100 percent accurately on site so it's been, been interesting, but it's, it, it is interesting. It's been well-priced. The government aren't uh, silly about that. So it's been well-priced, but as I say, we started with 65, we came down to a runoff of two, and now we're in the, in the winner's seat and we've got three years construction and 15 years of operation out in front of us. So, uh, and with the opportunity to do other things possibly in Hong Kong, this time with a fair dollar of experience. So that's, that's um, the end of my slideshow. Thank you very much. Alexander, outstanding. I mean, it's always, I mean, for me, I, I, I've known something of your journey, but nowhere near the complexities that you've had to face. But you are handling, you are dealing in a, obviously a very complex uh, area in terms of building, actually building, you know, production plants in that environment. So extraordinary, you know, congratulations on, on this far. Long may it keep. Well, and, uh, very kind, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Now I've got a. I've got a. I know you. I, your time for time. Time for time. So one question that's come up is, um, with all these challenges in Hong Kong and so on that have probably absorbed your bandwidth, uh, you know, dramatically over the over the previous year or so, particularly during COVID. Um, do you have further ambition, or, or has this whetted your appetite for further uh, export ambition? We do, and not just limited to the Far East, but also going back over towards the Americas. Um, and in the Middle East, there is, there is, a, there is a growing interest in things green, um, which probably has been missing up to now. So, yes, we still have ambitions, uh, foolish or not. Um, and I think that uh, in our particular sector, anaerobic digestion, there is a real appetite. And, uh, and we want to be on the, on the front end of that. But we are, um, we are a lot wiser now how we approach these markets. And... In some areas where COVID is going to be a restrictor, we would probably only offer support in the design and then allow the local teams to get on with on the ground. So actually we're not so hampered by COVID as we are now.
Alexander, excellent answer. Thank you. And that's very positive. And I don't sure whether you were in the in the meeting earlier on when uh, Julian and Spencer from UK EF and DIT were on. Um, yeah. They have a, an amazing array of support capabilities that you may or may not know about. But um, but we were very impressed with that. And maybe there's more you could do with them. So that, that's uh, no, actually uh, that was part of my comment about structure. We have structured ourselves in a manner which we needn't have, but that was the way we thought we'd do it, which actually disallowed us from getting UK export finance assistance. So we went down a long way with them. I think when they turned the pages of what we looked like as a, as a, as a structure out in Hong Kong, they said, sorry, it doesn't fit. So we'll know more next time and we'll be knocking on their door again, I promise. Okay, cool. Alexander, thank you very much again and may the rest of your day go seamlessly. Thank you very much. I do apologize for the first attempt. <laughs> Not at all. Anyway, cheerio. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, okay, well, look, it's, it's my... Great pleasure now to introduce the next speaker, Chris Gimmett, who is the director of Power Grids at Reactive Technology, which is a really, really innovative UK company. Um, it, you know, developing grids that have been to date so far inflexible, you know, to enable more reactive technology to come onto it. So please, Chris, I'm going to pass over to you. I've already met you this morning, so it's a joy to be able to introduce you to speak. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Duncan, and, and thank you for the opportunity to present and uh, join a group of really interesting speakers. Um, Reactive Technologies is a relatively young business focused on high granularity data for power grids. And uh, I'll try and give, you know, a, a kind of different spin to the, to, to the other presenters today. But first of all, just to introduce Reactive Technologies, if we can move over to the next slide. Um, I've been with Reactive Technologies for five years now. I think when, when I joined, we had around 120 patents and around 25 staff. Um, we have around 45 staff now and 180 patents. So we still have more patents than we do people. It's a very, very IP technology driven business. Um, we have our commercial headquarters in the UK and we have our technical team based out in Finland. So we have a lot of kind of um, uh, very, very uh, technical communication engineers who are looking at the power system in a very, very different way to how power system engineers would. And we're focused on enabling renewable grids to accelerate the clean energy transition. So the whole point of our technology is to be able to integrate renewable energy into the grid in a very, very safe way and in a very, very cost effective way. Um, our first commercial service has been delivered in the UK with National Grid. Um, but we've already done some exporting. We've worked in Italy, in Japan, in Australia, in New Zealand. Um, and we are very much on a journey to, to uh, create a good, strong export business. Um, because we're working with transmission grids, we didn't really have a choice. There's only one national grid in the UK. So if we wanted to work with another national grid equivalent, we had to look outside the UK borders. Um, and the support from DIT and UKF has been really, really uh, excellent on that journey. If we can move over to the, to, to the next slide, I just wanted to tee up the kind of problems that we're trying uh, to solve on grids. And fundamentally, when we put more renewable energy into grids, to get from renewables to 10%, there's no worries at all. To push from 50% to 100%, there's quite a lot of technical challenges. So from a transmission perspective, uh, we look at the stability of the frequency on the power system and uh, we look at measurement of inertia. On the distribution grid, we look at the stability of, of voltage. Fundamentally, old fossil fuel generators have uh, a lot of stability that comes uh, with them. Uh, running a grid that is based on coal and based on gas is a bit like driving a steam train. It's very big, it's very heavy, it's very stable, it rides through faults very well but it does burn a lot of coal and create a lot of emissions. Um, a modern power system with lots of renewables that are physically lighter, wind turbines and solar panels don't have these big heavy spinning assets. Um, the control room environment is a little bit more like trying to ride a motorbike than it is drive a, drive a steam train. And over on the next slide, we can see a very kind of good example of that. Um, like I said, you have this, uh, these, these big heavy spinning assets that are providing a lot of kinetic energy uh, to grids, 
in the old world. Um, but in the new world, you have a very, very light grid, and that can lead to instability because we're trying to balance this motorcycle. We need a lot of uh, fine tuning. If we look at grid globally, we see, we see a, a huge increase in the amount of energy storage being deployed. You know, part of that is to address intermittency. You know, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. But a lot of that is to address this balancing a motorbike problem. Batteries react more quickly. They can inject power very, very quickly. They can do very fast frequency response. And that's very important for power grids going forward. The technology that we have developed is to help grids really understand this. And we have a world first technology in being able to measure how much inertia is on the grid. We can measure how heavy a grid is. It's a real enabling technology to bring more renewables on. Over on the next slide, um, that's important because, uh, well, three reasons really. Uh, the first is risk. Uh, big utilities, the national grids of this world, the, the Thai powers of this world that have already been mentioned, they're very, very risk averse. Uh, they do not want to be the ones who are uh, on, on watch while the lights go out. So there's a, a huge focus from these utilities on risk. In order to manage risk, uh, there's a cost element that's associated to it. Um, so if we look at you know, investments in battery storage, they're very expensive. If we look at investments in synchronous condensers and other technologies, those are very expensive. If we look at the cost of curtailing renewables and bringing fossil fuel back, one, that's kind of... Uh, more difficult morally than it used to be and politically than it used to be. But two, there's a very high cost associated with curtailing renewables and, and bringing fossil fuels back. Um, over on the next slide, we can kind of bring that to life with our UK case study. So we're taking measurements for national grid in the UK. Um, can we change on to the next slide? Um, <clears throat> and this is the, the business case for national grid investing in this technology. We all remember the, the 9th of August 2019 power outage and one of the key things that Ofgem flagged was that National Grid have to pay far closer to attention to measuring and understanding inertia. Over the last few years, the cost that they've spent has escalated hugely. Um, it's been mentioned a couple of times, uh, the um, international trade missions. and. We have found those incredibly helpful and not just uh, reactive technologies going on international trade missions, uh, but also uh, foreign utilities coming on trade missions to the UK. Um, so kind of tying into uh, what Julian and Spencer were saying, um, Julian was mentioning that in Taiwan, we have this big success of the Formosa wind farm. And one of the things that uh, Thai Power wanted to do is they wanted to come to the UK and understand how to integrate large quantities of renewables into the power system. They spoke to National Grid and they also spoke to reactive technologies about the measurements we're taking, about the experience that National Grid have had of integrating renewables and the massive increase they've had in balancing costs over the last few years. And as a result of that discussion that we had, we're now in not quite signed contract, but very you know, advanced discussions with them about how we deploy our technology um, in Taiwan for Thai power to help them with understanding the physical impacts of these uh, large wind farms and how best to integrate uh, that power into their grids, integrate that power into the system. Over on the next slide, I'll explain just a little bit about uh, how we take our measurements. This is, like, as I said, a very, very unique technology. It's kind of like sonar for the power grid. So we deploy what we call a modulator device. We are actively sending power into the grid. We have our measurement units, which are uh, called XMUs and are sampling frequency 48,000 times a second. And we're streaming that data into a cloud platform. Um, it's relatively easy to deploy in comparison to other kind of uh, instrumentation systems. And it's very, very unique in that it's active measurement. We are pulsing the grid and then we're seeing how the grid reacts and we're taking in huge amounts of data and we're deploying it via cloud. So there's kind of innovation upon uh, innovation that's being uh, deployed in these power systems. Um, one thing that's quite difficult working with utilities, going back to that risk aversion point, um, cloud for them is a new thing. Sending a pulse into a grid is a new thing and taking very, very granular measurements and actually understanding and knowing what to do with them is also a very, very new thing. So for us, it's been really critical, one, to have the support of National Grid in the UK, but 
also to have the support of the UK government and DIT, who can you know, explain the path that the UK has been on and, and how this fits into the overall picture. So I just wanted to, uh, after introducing our technology, I wanted to end on a few thoughts you know, to do with exporting and the journey that we've been on. Because, um, you know, hopefully this will be very relevant. So uh, over on the next slide, um, just kind of a, a, you know, a picture of uh, where we've been so far. So we've done a lot in the UK uh, with National Grid, with SSC, and also with uh, UK Power Networks. So we worked with across, you know, transmission and distribution in the UK. But because of the nature of the customers we're working with, as I mentioned, you kind of uh, run out of customers quite quickly. We've also done work with Turner in Italy, with TEPCO in Japan, with AMO in Australia, Transpower in New Zealand. And Alexander actually just mentioned the Middle East. We have a very, very fast growing pipeline across the Middle East. Uh, that is a region that has historically not deployed a lot of renewables. And if we think the transition has happened quickly in the UK, I mean, the transition is going to happen a lot quicker there. Uh, the amount of funding that's going into renewables, the size of projects that they're putting in place, um, they're really concerned about how that is going to affect the stability of the grid and, and how they get measurement platforms in place to enable that. Similarly with uh, Taiwan that I already mentioned, they're looking at deploying these large wind farms and they want the data in the control room to understand what is the impact of this renewable. And again, make sure they have this enabling technology and make sure they have uh, the data in the control room. Over in the States, we're seeing quite a lot of interest being driven by Biden's infrastructure fund. And again, a lot of renewables going into a very big system, huge amount of scale and you know, what are the fundamental enabling architectures, the enabling technologies they need to put in place to, to, to understand uh, what is going on. So I think particularly with a small business, timing is everything. And the timing right now with the net zero agenda, with the huge push for renewables seems uh, uh, very, very uh, right. And we're seeing uh, a lot of growth. And uh, Duncan, you mentioned that you hope uh, 20 to 30 percent of REE members, REA members, could be exporters. I'd love to see that number be 100 percent, and to see the UK really driving the agenda in, in clean growth and creating that clean growth export story. And I just wanted to finish on a, on a, on a few so thoughts about you know what what that journey meant for us, um, and, and how this is applicable to others, and what we learned from the process. So. Over on the next slide, we found it was very, very helpful to start small. Don't start with trying to win multi-million pound contracts in a very, very difficult jurisdiction. We found that very, very hard. Instead, focus on something small scale that you can deliver primarily from the UK if you can. That's really helped us to flush out any, any issues that we fundamentally had you know, with the core service and flush that out on a small scale and flush that out with our core team who understand the technology in a, in, in a very, very deep way. So uh, effectively running pilots and doing that from home base rather than jumping in feet first and, 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 and trying to create um, a lot of moving parts. Instead, you know, move those parts one at a time by starting small and starting pilot. The second was on business development. So. If I cold call a utility, they have no idea who reactive technologies are. They've never heard of me before. Um, it's very, very difficult to actually uh, get a response. We found warm introductions from DIT, uh, whether from the DIT team in the UK or indeed the local embassy staff who've been incredibly helpful, generous with their time and supportive. Um, that's far more powerful than having cold calling. Um, again, particularly when you're dealing with large risk averse utilities or organizations, they like to have that kind of uh, so solid government backing and it lends a huge amount of credibility to an otherwise relatively small organization, uh, but very innovative organization based in the UK. The third on delivery and ops, and you know, this is a very high level point in comparison to previous presentations that went into this point in an enormous amount of detail. But for me, finding local partners Understanding the local rules and, and, and regulations is critically important. Um, there are a number of consultancies that can help you out with this, and yeah, both DIT and UKF have been very supportive with us in helping us understand those local rules and introducing us to those local partners as well. You know, we found that uh, the physics of every power system is identical. 
So the technology works wherever you put it. But the rules, the regulations, you know, the market is radically different. The electron doesn't care where it is, but it turns out the people do care where they are. So very, very important to you know, use those tools that we have, find those local partners and get the, the deep understanding of the markets that you're entering before jumping in you know, feet first and making any mistakes. So I just wanted to keep it to a, to a short presentation today. Um, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to speak and best of luck for all RE, REA members who are, who are heading on this export journey. Chris, thank you very much. Another superb presentation. And I love the anecdotes at the end, which were so helpful. And uh, isn't, isn't that the truth that uh, to get this energy, energy transition trans, you know, from, you know, to renewables, we will have to figure out how politics and, and, and electrons can work together. Hey? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chris. We'll be back to you later on with questions. So please hang in there. And now, so I'd like to introduce now, so perhaps if you could switch off your camera and your, and your microphone, then I'd like to introduce you to uh, Bill Ireland, CEO of Logan Energy, and I hopefully he is, gonna, he is going to come up. Um, there he is, Bill. Good, good, good afternoon, good morning. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Just uh, modifying my, uh, my camera, but uh, yes, I'm here. Excellent. Bill is in charge of a company called L Logan Energy, who is everything hydrogen uh, i've seen companies you know in hydrogen that are doing very specific things bill has figured on a business model that, that allows him to play in almost every sector of the market and i i am sure it's going to grow into a fantastic business so bill over to you and we look forward to your presentation i will do question and answers for both yourself and and, and chris directly after this okay Sure. Thanks very much. And thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I'll introduce Yushan um, uh, later on, um, who will cover some of our activities in China. Um, but um, to start with, a bit, of, a bit about us uh, and what we're doing. Um, uh, so we're Logan Energy. Um, we are hydrogen system experts, so our sort of energy systems using hydrogen, and we integrate loads of other stuff as well. Next, time, next slide, please. Um, we go back to 95 uh, when we were set up in the states uh, in 2005 we were set up in the uk um we were uh, in the states we were pretty much installing bits of um bits of kit for manufacturers like utc fuel cell um energy um and doing the balance of plant around it um the uk business was set up around uh, providing a, a whole solution whole energy solution around combined cooling heat and power plants running or uh, using fuel cells running off natural gas or biogas um and then about 10 years ago we decided that uh, that actually there was a um a limited um future for distributed generation running off fossil fuels so we actively got involved in more hydrogen projects uh, and directly re with renewables uh, we did the leave mouth community energy project which i'll come on to in a bit but we found there were massive holes in the supply chain in the uk uh, and in fact around the world um, for hydrogen technologies and integration into those systems so we set up a number of subsidiaries that could actually deal with that because after working those out finding the fact that people weren't there we brought them in-house and we set up little divisions within the business um, because we do so much um, uh, sort of uh, across the spectrum of everything from maintenance to importing equipment to energy systems and design um, that we needed to set them up into different we're a relatively small company. We're 42 today, I think, 43 on Monday, um, uh, but expanding uh, considerably in the UK. Um, and uh, so um, on the back of that, we've actually got a number of projects abroad, uh, hence hence we're here. Um, and uh, we have a, um, a company set up in the Netherlands, partly to do with Brexit, partly to do with um, hydrogen um, being very popular in the North Netherlands because of the shutting down of the Groningen gas field. Um, and then we have a joint venture in China, which Yushan will talk about. Um, but uh, 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 next slide, please. <clears throat> of a time lag some of our customers um they vary from uh research or, or not um notified bodies through to the queen who uh, we installed the fuel cell for canary wharf some of the oems um basically pulling all their equipment together and to make a system work basically in focus and marine for example looking at ships next slide please so um what we do um 
because of all that's all over the place. I'll, I'll, if you next slide, please. We are manufacturer independent. Um, so although we do manufacture ourselves, the big lumps of kit like electrolyzers or fuel cells um, or cylinders, or whatever, we will buy those in. But because we're independent, we can actually um, pull in whatever bit of kit is right for the particular project. Um, we integrate energy systems, so we will incorporate batteries, we'll incorporate combustion engines, um, but generally around, if it doesn't involve hydrogen, we, we, we won't be doing it, um, but we are integrating all of those systems to make a proper energy system. So it's interesting to hear about the energy balancing uh, earlier as well, because uh, hydrogen is also an energy balancing mechanism for actually switching on load or switching off load, as well as supporting it by injecting uh, uh, electricity back into the grid. Um, because of the supply chain issues, um, they're actually a number, uh, sort of the, one of the most economic, um, uh, um, economically positive ways of deploying hydrogen is actually in, uh, in transport because we're offsetting uh, petrol and diesel at fairly high prices. Um, the problem is the number of manufacturers out there that are providing the vehicles, but also where they're willing to sell them and support them after sales wise. Uh, so I have a project in Tenerife, I'll come on to that in a moment, but we got into that because there was no one or not enough people doing it. We're also distributing hydrogen, so in transporting it both in pipeline and also on vehicles. And then um, a surprisingly large hole is actually people wanting to maintain it afterwards. Um, so lots of people want to sell, sell the technology, but then there are very few people doing the operating and maintenance of it. Next slide, please. Um, bring that into context, um, as far as our model is concerned, one of the key things is technology and supplier agnostic. So we will use different technologies and different manufacturers to provide the solution for the customer. Um, we haven't actually provided um, a solution that was tendered to the customer that we have won. We have, it's always changed after discussing it and that's the customer focus on quite often they don't really know what they, what they want. Um, they've read lots of things about it. They may have their own in-house engineers that are generalists, potentially not specialists. And so we work with them to actually sort of say, okay, right, well, if you take this lump out here, which you don't really need, you can actually improve what you're prov what we're, what we're providing for you by putting it in over there or just save money or whatever. Um, one of the key things is our track record, um, very good um, project delivery, and that's uh, actually respected um, all, all over the world, which is good um, because of what we've deployed already and, and continue to deploy. Um, in-house capability, the majority of what we do is in-house um, because uh, it's far more reliable um, uh, and, uh, to be honest, cheaper to do it ourselves. Um, and uh, and then we do the operating and maintenance as well. Um, part of our design, we've developed IP, both in software and hardware, um, to uh, reduce the capex and opex of systems. Because again, a lot of the big utilities like to go down the route of the EPC contracting where they've selected something and they say, okay, right, let's go and buy that, let's go and buy that, let's go and buy that and plug it all together. And that's not necessarily optimized. So one of the things we do is actually optimize that whole process. So actually you can reduce quite easily the capex and the opex. Next slide, please. So where we sit, um, this is very much around energy economy, around hydrogen. We don't necessarily do the renewable generation, although we may get into that going forward uh, as far as build, own, operate. Um, we do some smart grid management, which uh, is probably not as smart as the previous previous presentation, but it but it's about using uh, optimizing the renewable generation to actually generate cheaper hydrogen, uh, but also maximize your um, uh, economic benefits for your systems. We'll then install, we'll sort of select, install, um, commission uh, electrolyzers, steam methane reforming uh, of biogas or natural gas with with or without carbon capture. We're preferably around the renewable side. So green hydrogen. Um, we also look at the optimization of the compression and, and storage, what pressures, temperatures, rates, etc., to meet the demand. Uh, and that demand is anything from refueling stations, which is actually probably 50% of our turnover at the moment is building refueling stations. Um, and then also, if you're putting it into vehicles, what's the dispensing load? profile so what size refueling station you need or capacity and then also into industry so um, as a feedstock um, as, a, as a thermal um, source 
or as regenerating electricity, which in theory is actually what you do in a vehicle anyway. You're just regenerating electricity. You're using hydrogen to generate electricity to propel the vehicle. Next slide, please. Um, so we've got lots of nice slides like that. Um, and this is something we've delivered back in 2016. Um, and this is sort of a microgrid um, demonstration to see how you can operate um, uh, wind and solar, uh, electricity generation, renewable generation to actually supply power and heat and transport fuel uh, for a small community. And this was sort of an industrial estate, all connected to the grid, but again, also the effect it has on the grid as far as reactive components going on to it. So that's uh, delivering it as well. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, this is sort of typically what we do. We've developed our own um, frames to put it in, which are modular. So uh, we can have those in, in, in effect in stock. Uh, we can have a number of uprights. They're all the same and produce something, anything from four foot to 40 foot long that's easily transportable. Um, we do a lot of commissioning. Uh, it's fully commissioned here before it goes to, to site. So therefore on site stuff um, is reduced. We've done some of our own um, IP in here. We do all our own panels and that sort of thing. Next slide, please. Uh, and next slide, sorry, should have, should have taken those ones out anyway. Um, this is something from Arup, um, uh, who, uh, I mean, there are loads, loads out there, loads of people coming up with sort of where it all sits, but this is pretty much looking at where hydrogen economy um, sits within our current um, uh, infrastructure and uses and, and where it can be used using some of our existing um, sort of fossil fuel base with carbon capture and storage all the way through to renewables to uh, to green hydrogen and mixing it together. It will be a gradual transition. It won't happen overnight. Um, and so we need to be realistic about it, which I think are a lot of idealists around and a lot of uh, sort of um, Luddites around. Uh, and what we need is actually to mix that all together and uh, have a reasonable way forward. Next slide, please. Um, looking at the current world energy powers I and mean, sort of world opportunities, I mean, that, that sort of, uh, we did that sort of thing in, in, in Scotland at the Levermouth project. Um, uh, you then see that in the industrial application and then you say, well, actually, okay, right, well, that can be anywhere in the world, whether it be an islanded network or whether it be a, a city sitting on its own. Uh, not connected to it, a distributed grid, whether it's Western Australia, which only which is isolated, their grid is isolated, um, those sort of things. So the current world energy power is just looking at natural gas uh, and who's generating it, who's using it, and then what we're doing as far as shipping it around. Next slide, please. So we then look at the new world energy powers if we're transitioning to renewable energy and you look at the, uh, the land-based uh, solar and wind profiles. Um, and uh, the UK is pretty good and Scotland's pretty good as far as wind energy is concerned. But actually, when you look at solar and other wind opportunities around the world, that's sort of where we're looking as far as um, sort of uh, you're looking at swathes of potentially solar solar power um, through the equatorial um, sort of desert areas. Um, and Australia is doing a hell of a lot on it. And so is Chile. Um, next slide, please. So that's our opportunities for, for moving moving, uh, moving out there. Uh, as far as global clusters go, um, we've been on a number of tra trade missions uh, virtually and physically. We've had a number of um, uh, people um, coming in. Um, hold on a sec. Sorry, a colleague of mine was just talking, talking loudly, though. I don't know if you can hear them or not, but... Um, uh, so um, a number of trade missions uh, over a lot over Europe um, uh, with COP26. There were a number of uh, countries came in uh, to see us, uh, sort of trade missions from various countries um, around Europe and, and the uh, the Far East, um, the Indonesia. Uh, and that sort of thing. Um, we've set up a joint venture in China, um, uh, and Yushan will explain about that. And that's um, we're using, relying very heavily on uh, on Yushan and his uh, family uh, company, um, uh, Langjing, um, uh, to um, sort of introduce us to the Chinese way of doing things, um, and also contacts there. Uh, and to to a degree, we wouldn't really be doing that um uh, without um uh, that joint venture going ahead and and uh, working with langxing uh, we wouldn't be trying to do that we would be sticking more to uh, european uh, elements australian uh, potentially african but that's really these these clusters are basically where there's a lot of interest in hydrogen so that's where we're focusing however we've quoted for operations in the in in the middle east um uh, in north america um, we're also looking at uh, sort of uh, opening up in Spain. Um, that will open up some of the Hispanic-speaking um, uh, regions 
Um, so, um, and again, sort of help us with that. So overcoming these sort of barriers. And I think um, what was said earlier about don't start big, it's we started off very simply doing the simple bits um, uh, and then we've just grown as far as getting more complicated in what we do, but also in different countries, um, again, starting off with a, with a project potentially based, designed and based from here. And then what we want to do is uh, is then go through um, sort of local uh, local um, arrangements, either joint ventures or um, sort of acquisitions or whatever in, in the local regions, because actually the economics around hydrogen vary forget country to country by region to region um, you have different taxes i mean look at the states you've got different taxes on everything state by state um, and that happens in lots of uh, uh, in lots of countries um, uh, sort of or states within countries um, some of the challenges um, i think was mentioned earlier um, i haven't got culture in here but actually culture is, is a big one that i should have had in here um, regulations um, the problem is there are very few regulations around hydrogen some of them are based around the traditional use of hydrogen so for example in china um, if you produce hydrogen, you're actually a chemical company. Um, so um, you need a chemical um, uh, for, um, uh, license. And in some areas, you can't do that because um, it's a restricted area. And again, Yushan will explain on that sort of thing. Standardization, similar sort of thing. We're actually helping write some of the standards uh, around the world, um, getting involved in that. Um, understanding around hydrogen and the hydrogen economy and everybody says oh you need lots of water or or it's explosive um, or it's a bomb or whatever and it's getting all of that there and most of most of my life in the hydrogen sector I've been explaining to people sort of yes it is dangerous but so is um, sort of stepping off a pavement into a road um, or having um, LPG in a tank or whatever or in fact having a nice petrol bomb in, the, in your car with a single lining on it um, uh, where that could explode as well um, uh, on the uh, sort of approvals again, um, economic variance I've mentioned um, and uh, policy is a big driver for us. Um, without the policy, hydrogen won't necessarily um, come into it. So you need to understand that. So it's actually working with uh, local operators, local uh, developers to actually look at that. Uh, and then the supply chain, some of the some of the stuff, I mean, we buy in stuff from all over the world. Um, some of the hydrogen equipment, um, there's a single supplier for. Um, next slide, please. I think this should be over to you, Sean, now. Oh, no, there's a few a few things. I'll, I'll run through these. Anyway, some of our examples, um, North Netherlands, 90 million euro project that we're doing some of it, um, some areas of it. Next slide, please. Uh, but that's an integrated hydrogen uh, economy, um, sort of a hydrogen valley. Sorry, next slide. Uh, Northern Ireland, again, wind turbines, high electrolyzers on site, uh, trailers we've provided, um, and then the refueler we've provided, and that's it being uh, leaving our um, facility uh, in Scotland um, and uh, going on to, um, uh, to site. Next slide, please. Uh, this is going out to Tenerife. Uh, in fact, it's out there. Um, again, exporting it to uh, to Spain. Uh, again, Tenerife has different regulations from mainland Spain. Next slide, please. Uh, another one in Germany, different regulations. Uh, we've had to work our way through those um, and uh, they don't necessarily understand their own regulations. And that's why we've ended up with various things like a concrete wall between the refilling station um, and the dispenser itself. Next slide, please. And then uh, a fun one, which is not too far from home, um, uh, which is whiskey, which is basically looking at the circular economy around there, producing zero um, uh, zero carbon whiskey, gin and vodka at a distillery, which we just done an announcement on today uh, that is going ahead um, and looking very much at that. Uh, again, a lot of interest from that and then actually the opportunity to uh, to expand. And our, our proposal is that actually we um, are focusing on those key areas and we'll set up in those key, key areas. Uh, again, starting at small scale or with partners. Next slide, please. And this is over to you, Shen. So I will uh, switch off. Uh, hi, everyone. I will expand a bit on the recent work, particularly in China. So this is the demonstration project we are currently developing with partner in Henan province of China. Although many regions in this market have made ambitious policies of using hydrogen energy for decarbonization and energy transition, however, the regulations and the technologies are not quite ready yet. So we are investing a lot of business development and pre-design efforts with our JV partners over there. 
So this is an integrated energy system built for decarbonization, uh, decarbonizing a manufacturing site. The system will only use rooftop solar PV and wind energy to produce and store green hydrogen, which will be used as a at the energy storage to supply hydrogen for refueling station and the fuel cell systems to generate electricity and heat for the users on site. So the system is designed to be the primary power source and can be run off grid for three days. Next slide, please. So the project is planned to be built on the 40,000 square meter land next to the factory with the functions of electricity generation, hydrogen and oxygen utilization within local ecosystem and the heat distribution. So upon now, a uh, 5.9 megawatt roof, rooftop PV has been built. So we, are, we will export hydrogen equipment design and uh, consultancy service to the project. And we are working with our partner to provide decarbonization solutions from UK. So the project is aiming to demonstrate the technologies and develop business models locally to further expand to the energy transition infrastructure development for, for the region, which is heavily relying on using oil and gas imported internationally. No, so this is the first project of its kind in China, and we have re received great support on the development from UK government. And uh, we are also working together with UK companies within this. Next slide, please. So we are sending out our integrated hydrogen generation and refueling station to China, which is planning to be arrived in February. So this is the first equipment uh, of this project. And uh, we are looking to, to export fuel cell systems and energy management softwares uh, in next stage, early next year. So this is fully built in UK and exporting to China. So we are working with technical collaborations with local suppliers and design institutions to build around this project. And uh, we've already looking, we are, we are already qualified to be detected on, you know, for, for other sites in China to be import duty free on all those technology development. So yeah, next slide, please. So that's our contact and happy to talk in the Q&A session. Thank you. Okay, Bill and Juan, thank you very much indeed for a very insightful um, presentation on, uh, you've got a real tiger by the tail there in terms of you know the expansion opportunities around the world. So well done. And, and it's great to see we're exporting something to China, hey? That's great. Um, now, if I may then open it up and, and, and Chris, perhaps you could come back now onto the video, which you've just done, thank you. And, and we'll have some questions and answers in, the, in no particular order. And, and Bill, are you, you, you're on and, and Chris. So Chris, can you come back on, you're on? Yep, I'm here. You're good, okay, well done. I'm afraid my, my screen has got cut off for some reason at the bottom, so I can't see everybody. But well done, yes I can, here we go. Yeah, that's marvelous. There we go. Oh, got you now. Good. Okay. Well, look, uh, we're 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 running tight on time, but let's let's just have two or three questions and answers here because it's such a you know an important area. There, I've got a question for Chris. I mean, in the UK, you started off and and you've got great traction because you've got you know you're you're you've found a way of getting biz and national grid to work and help you you know demonstrate how the your technologies can dramatically changed the way the grid is managed. And, and then you've got some physical connections to the grid and, and so on. When you go abroad, how have you, because in the UK, you've got, you know, you've got things that you're supplying to the grid as well as consulting. When you go abroad, presumably you're starting off more with consulting. Is that a dramatically different model? Um. There's kind of, uh, I, I guess, two points to make. So, so one, we almost try and bring the UK customer with us. If if not, 
you know, physically, then at least to have a video case study for them or to set up a phone call with the customers in the other countries so that they can, you know, understand what we're doing in the UK and not hear it from us as a sales pitch, but hear it from the customer in terms of this is the value that I got from the technology. That That's very, very helpful as part of a sales process and part of kind of establishing the credibility of, abroad. Um, and I talked about, um, yeah, starting with baby steps. So that can be either starting with, you know, a very, very small implementation, or it could be starting with some consultancy work. Um, that is difficult. It, it, it tends to be, you know, a lot of effort to get something off the ground, which is ultimately quite a small project. You might not be earning the same margin on it. So we've had to kind of, you know, set just very clear expectations with our investors about, you know, the amount of time this exporting journey is going to take. And from a delivery perspective, we've almost had to over resource a little to make sure we're delivering quality. And when we go to these other countries, uh, not an easy process, um, but one that, you know, with, with enough planning, you can get through. It's, it, it strikes us in, in, in our questioning here that the world needs you, right? As they need Bill, but the world needs you in turn in, to help deliver you know, the electrons in the right format from the right sources to the right places. Um, so are you, so ramping up for you is really, and, and for the world, is really, really important. How, does, how do you handle that in your management style, as it were, and the, your approach to these markets? Sure, and yeah, we've that's very kind words. We definitely view it as an, an enabling technology. Um, what's interesting is, it, it, you know, if you talk to the people who are in the grids dealing with the day-to-day -day reality of today, uh, they're dealing with the, 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 the fossil fuel generators. They, they don't see an urgent need for this technology because the fossil fuels are plentiful. The grid hasn't had a blackout yet. Everything's fine. We don't have a large proportion of renewables. So why do we need the enabling technology? So the key has been to get the right level of conversation, to get to the director of operations, who's actually has an eye on the future, who may be attending COP26, who understands what the government is doing, the targets, the amount of renewables, and the need to put these enabling ones in. And we found using, using DIT and a warm introduction has been extremely helpful rather than only doing it on itself. So one is, you know, targeting the right people and then using the right channels to try and get to those people has made a big difference for us. Well, that's, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, then I'd like to move on to Bill, if I may. Bill, a couple of questions for you. Um, your, I mean, your approach to going global looks really comprehensive and thought through and is it fair to say that you're tackling po politics head on? You 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 just go for the deal and figure out the politics as you go along. Is that how, how does how does it work for you? Because you've been extraordinarily successful in these in these areas that are, are traditionally quite difficult to export to. Um, yeah, pretty much. Uh, I mean, the thing is, I think. Um, we're unique in what we do. We don't know anybody else in the world that is doing the variety of all the way through from uh, renewable electrical generation at varying outputs to using the uh, using the hydrogen, um, uh, so the end user basically, and, and the product. So we know the profiles, how to do it all. So that is um, uh, sought after. So it helps us. Um, particularly with the projects we've done, which have been supported by European funding and UK funding, um, some of those projects early on, and we're now looking at commercial rollout, um, and we're targeting those areas that, or those regions and policies, uh, countries that have the policy to support that. So, uh, and that's really we're following the the interest um, and those those uh, those countries. So, the politics is sort of there already in the fact that there's interest um, and there's um, either taxation or carrot, carrot or stick uh, depending on what it is um, so that's what we've done but yes once once you get into those projects you then have a whole nother level of complexity of actually delivering it um, and dealing with the politics and dealing with the uh, uh, perception of hydrogen perception of renewable energy yeah well it's not really how well how much embodied carbon is there in a wind turbine sort of arguments and and those sort of things um you still get all of that you still get the hindenburg mentioned um 
but my response to that is pretty is pretty much well if we've done a 100 years without a serious hydrogen uh, disaster then we're not doing too badly and it wasn't the hydrogen that did it in the first place so you have to come up you you always come up with these and you just have to take them on the chin and get on and deliver what what's being required and and educate people actually yeah super now i can see that so you know you've got a relatively small team now so you know ramping up carefully and 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 uh sort of ex exponentially is going to be a, a challenge but skills but skills is the main the main problem and that's partly why we are looking at um pockets of deployment around um sort of uh, the country different countries is so that we can tap into those resources uh, because they're not all in one place uh, it's uh, uh, i think the uh oil and gas centers of Aberdeen and Houston, we're not going to get that with hydrogen. We're going to, we're going to get distributed cent, uh, uh, sort of uh, lots of smaller distributed um, centers of expertise. Um, and so that's what we're trying, that's our strategy to actually do that uh, small number of high quality individuals and production facilities. Great, great feedback and great feedback for Lynn, Lynn and Spencer. You know, this is to make these things happen. There's a, there's a lot of things that need to go on yeah, building the foundation. So thank you for that. Just a quick side question from my personally: um, Is three dollars a kilo the break the break even point for hydrogen, or is it a bit higher than that? Uh, no, diesel diesel equivalent price. We're looking at about five quid, um, uh, five quid a kilo in the UK. Um, the problem is, which is I think what Norway um, sort of uh, found. Um, after introducing sort of tax advantages and other incentives for electric vehicles is a the revenue starts dropping because you're not paying tax on your fuel you're actually being subsidized uh, and at some point there's a tipping point there where you actually have to stand on your own two feet um, but they also allowed electric vehicles they gave them free parking and free charging in the middle of towns they allowed them to use bus lanes um, the bus lanes then got choked up so they then had to stop that so it, there's a there's a um, there's a whole um, acceleration um, of um, a small num amount of deployment, and it's similar to again grid balancing. Uh, the more you get renewables or um, ch electric charging or whatever onto the grid, the um, more the grid needs balancing, um, and it's the same same sort of thing. Um, I don't know whether Chris wants to come in on that one, but um, it's it's use and uh, and production. Um, and actually managing that. And there needs to be an awful lot of management and sort of hydrogen can actually help that. I mean, sort of hydrogen production um, uh, because it can be switched on and switched off when when there's too much demand or, or too little demand. Great. Chris, Chris, Chris we've, seen at half past, we've seen at half past midnight every day on our platform, there's a huge pickup in the grid, uh, which is everybody's EV charges coming on on the sort of economy seven tariffs that kick in at half past midnight. And that... Yeah. That, you know, a big 300 megawatt swing already, and we're just at the start of the sort of the EV rollout. But you can kind of view that with one of two mindsets. You can either go, hey, that's a new and difficult problem. Isn't that a pain for the grid? Or you view it as an opportunity. Wow, there's a really? there that, that never was. Where, yeah. where should I deploy that? But then you, you need the infrastructure and the smart charging to be able to do this. That's cool. Exactly. Thank far, you. More, far more intelligence in it, yeah. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Great answers. Thank you. And I'm sure you two are going to be right at the forefront of getting, you know, I don't know, hydrogen molecules and electrons to, to um, help politics move along. Anyway, um, I've got one question, the last question for, for China. Juan, is, um, is China definitely going hydrogen? Just can you give us a feel? Is it, is it a big move in China as it is in Europe and America? Uh, China is very diversified in the energy system, so it's a very regional thing. So major cities has has formed up uh, solid policies for hydrogen, but uh, some remote areas they are still not making up demand yet. But hydrogen, green hydrogen, is uh, definitely moving in China. So either they are going for for uh, ammonia or methanol in the future, but now everyone agrees green hydrogen is a must step before that. Super, so it's very diversified, but still, you know, if you catch the right region, you got strong support. 
Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, China is enormous and, and extraordinarily complicated, but thank you very much for that summary. Well, look, gentlemen, thank you very much for the last presentation, the last three presentations. Um, I'd like to then, if I may, thank you all very much indeed for your material this morning. Uh, we will, we have obviously videoed this and we will be, uh, you know, discussing with you how we might use it productively. But at the moment, I'd like to finish the uh, this morning session and we'll move on now, if we may, to the networking session. So again, thank you very much indeed to all the presenters.